is that it's very, very rough. Now, did you see that tongue? Absolutely amazing. Now, those hooks on the tongue are very, very powerful. And uh, they actually rasp the flesh off the bone of its prey. Look at that. Incredible, isn't it? So, I suppose you could say that Leo could literally lick you to death. My brilliant pet! My name is Dan. I keep cockroaches. They're my brilliant pet, so they live in my T-shirt. Can the same animal live in two different parts of the world at exactly the same time? Right, well, OK, let's imagine this is the UK countryside. In the evening... <laughs> Spencer, in the evening, you might be lucky enough to come across a vulpus vulpus. A what? A fox, or, if it's the springtime, a family of fox cubs, like this one here. You see, the fox has done so well in the UK that if you wander around the town late at night, you might see one or two wandering around. On the other hand, you may find an Erinaceous Europaeus. A what? A hedgehog, of course. Oh, yeah. I knew that. It was my, um, vulpus vulpus that didn't understand. <clears throat> anyway, hedgehogs are noisy little things as they snuffle about, so if there is one around, you're likely to find it. So there you go, a fox and a hedgehog, two animals of the British countryside. Or are they? Here in the desert, you also get foxes, but where the British fox has a red coat, the fennec fox here has a golden-coloured coat. Now, this obviously helps it camouflage itself in the sand, and it also reflects the sunlight, which keeps it cool. Now, both foxes like to hunt at night, but if you look very carefully at this fox's ear, you'll see that they're absolutely massive. Now, this helps them here in the vast open spaces of the desert when they want to catch their prey, and they've also got very large eyes as well, which helps them see their prey. And if you can just see its feet, you'll see that they're very furry. Now, these act a bit like oven gloves, which will protect them from the hot desert sand. Now, both foxes obviously need to drink, and the British fox has got no problem because it nearly always rains in that country. But in the desert, they have to get their liquid from their food, which is a good thing because it hardly ever rains in the desert. Now, as well as foxes, you'll also find hedgehogs, like this little guy. Now, like our British hedgehogs, they can roll themselves up into a ball, but there are some differences. First of all, if you look at the hedgehog's ears, you'll see that they're enormous compared to our hedgehogs. And it's the same principle as the fox. They need big ears so that they can hear their prey over the vast spaces of the desert. Now, they need to be a lot quieter than our guys because they haven't got as much hunting cover in the desert as you would do in the British countryside. And Another main difference is that our hedgehogs at home have short, stumpy little legs, whereas the desert hedgehog has much longer legs, and this is so he can travel quickly and it also keeps him off the hot sand. So there you go. The hedgehog... And the fox are alive and well... And living in the desert. And... and the United, United Kingdom. Kingdom. If you watched the last series of Brilliant Creatures, you may well remember that I went to America in search of wildlife. Well, in this series, we've gone to another country in search of some more brilliant creatures. Whale sharks, crocodiles, turtles. Have you guessed where? Have you? No. Australia. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the few places in the world where there are still marine turtles. Despite having lived in the sea for over a hundred million years, sea turtles are having trouble surviving. So, although this looks like a scene from a James Bond movie, Ian Bell and Sam DeBella are actually marine rangers and we're about to do some serious conservation work. Turtle tagging, and it's not for the faint of heart. Tagging means Ian and Sam can work out how many turtles there are where they migrate to, how big they grow, important information needed to protect them. This one is a young green turtle. Absolutely beautiful, just look at it. So we're going to put this tag into this scale here. As you can see, the, the, the turtle flinched a little bit. Yeah. I'm sure it felt it going in there. It'd be just like somebody getting their ears pinned.
the way up. This turtle has a beautiful shell, which sadly has been its downfall. It's a hawksbill turtle. They're critically endangered internationally in the, right. in the world. The, the this is the, the shell that, that's used in the, in the ornamental trade. Right. So it's, uh, it's what the Japanese call beko. Right. Oh. <laughs> it's nice to go with it, really. Yep. Ian then spots a huge turtle. You don't see these every day. She's a mature green turtle, Just an old lady of a hundred years and weighs about a hundred kilograms. One, two, three. Now, isn't that sensational? Ready? One, two, three. Oh. Catching turtles? No problem. Even in a pink wetsuit. wetsuit, Terry. <laughs> Less said about the wetsuit, the better. <laughs> it looked pretty dangerous, actually. It was, actually, but I wasn't told to afterwards, because what can happen? When you dive on top of the turtle, you can actually smash all your teeth out, you know? Well, you didn't have too much to worry about. You missed. <laughs> <laughs> so but what can we expect on the next trip? Thanks. Well, the biggest fish in the world, the whale shark. Wow, I can't wait for that. But first, this. Meet Joey. Joey's a brilliant baby rhesus macaque and he's being hand-reared because his mum rejected him. She couldn't look after him. But the family who are looking after Joey are at his beck and call 24 hours a day. He's a very spoilt little monkey. Aren't you, Joey? You've got to agree, he's pretty cute, though. But being so cute doesn't always guarantee you an easy time. In the wild, rhesus macaques live in large groups, which are divided up by a hierarchy, which means that some monkeys are more important than others. Now, an important mum has an important baby, and no one will dare mess with an important baby. But if Joey's mum hadn't been important, the chances are he'd probably be pushed around and bullied by monkeys from higher up the group, and there's nothing his mum could have done to prevent it. So, if you're a brilliant baby rhesus macaque in the wild, life's either perfect or just plain unfair. Isn't it, Joey? <laughs> This is the Emperor Scorpion. Just look at the size of it. In fact, it's one of the largest you can find, and it certainly looks mean, doesn't it? Now, you may be thinking I'm a bit of a nutter to be holding it in my hand, and I'm actually not too happy about it at all. But when it comes to scorpions, biggest doesn't necessarily mean deadliest. Now, this fella's got huge pincers to catch his dinner with, so he doesn't need a particularly bad sting. And if he did get me, it would be about as bad as a bee sting, which is bad enough, so I'm being as delicate with him as I possibly can. Now, the golden rule is, when it comes to scorpions, that the smaller the scorpion is and the weedier its pincers, the more deadly its sting. Now, until recently, not many species of scorpion were known, and that's because most of them are small, and they only like to come out at night, because uh, they don't really like the bright light. So how do you find a scorpion when the lights go out? Terry! Well done, Chris. Now, stumbling about in the dark isn't very practical or effective, especially when the scorpion blends in with its surroundings. But there is one light, which you can use, and that's called ultraviolet light. And then finding a scorpion is a piece of cake. Now, just look at that lot in there. There's literally loads of them. And they're all fluorescent. In other words, they are all glowing. Now, that is a brilliant way to find scorpions in the dark. And scientists like to use that system all of the time because it helps them study them but without disturbing them too much. Brilliant but deadly, unlike our next guest. Let me introduce you to Madeline. She's a secretary bird. She's a true aristocrat of the bird world. Beautiful to look at. Those long legs, the neck. 
beautiful colours on the face. She's a peace-loving bird. Unless, of course, you're a snake. <laughs> Now, secretary bird comes from the Arabic word sector, meaning warrior. And warrior, Madeline certainly is. What a remarkable bird. It's not a real snake, but it's good enough for Madeline to show you just how she'll go about an attack. I'll try and bring Madeline round a little bit over here so you can see the feathers at the back. Now, they are used to confuse a snake into thinking that that is actually a third leg. And what Madeline hopes is that the snake will attack the feathers rather than her legs. Also, she has feathers at the back of her head to try and confuse a snake to think that's an, another target to get, which, of course, it isn't. A secretary bird can box kick, a bit like a kangaroo, and it'll do that to protect itself if a snake rears up. So there you have it, the secretary bird, a beautiful, graceful, peaceful bird until it sees a snake. <whistles> Whoa. Well, that's it for another episode of Brilliant Creatures. And if you've just switched on, you've missed some brilliant animals. But don't worry, because next time we've got two beautiful wolves, we go down under and meet the awesome whale.